Um, thank you so much for everyone who has joined us on a on a Monday a meeting a webinar on a Monday morning. It's um, thank you so much. It's 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 really great to see so many people turning up. Um, my name's Paul Abenetti. I'm the Government Relations Manager at Bond. Um, I'm doing a very poor substitute for my colleague Rosemary, who manages our civil society policy work, who is unfortunately sick. Um, but uh, I have the great honour of welcoming our guests from Bates Wells. Um, just to give you a bit of background uh, with this session, we've done these types of sessions in the past with different general elections and um, with an election on the horizon, with, with an actual election that's been planned for a change, which is welcome. <laughs> um, uh, we thought it was good to invite our friends from Bates Wells to come and talk about the changes in electoral law. Um, and just to remind everyone that actually camp whilst campaigning, is a legitimate tool of, of civil society ahead of a general election. There are some limitations and stipulations that we all have to follow. And because the law has changed, um, it's my great honour to, to welcome Sue Ann and Max to uh, this session today to talk us through these changes and what that means for our organisations. Um, there's going to be some plenty, there's plenty of time at the end for some questions as well. So please do um, join in if you have anything to clarify or if you have any insights that you'd like to share. But yeah, um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our guests um, to make a start on the presentation. Cheers, thank you. Great, thank you. So maybe we'll just quickly introduce ourselves. My name's Suan. I'm a senior associate at Bates Wells um, in the charity team, but with a particular focus on politics, elections and campaigning. Um, and Max. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, my name is Max Dovenko. Um, I'm a solicitor also in the charity team with a focus on politics, elections, campaigning, like Suan. Um, I also used to work um, for a bit prior to training as a lawyer in international development. So it's an area that sort of um, I feel a close personal connection to. Great. Um, so as um was said in the introduction, we'll be covering election law and the recent changes to election law, um, but to kind of cover the, the whole um, area of context, we'll also first speak about charity law, appreciating that not everyone here will be from a charity or representing a charity. Um, it's an important kind of piece of the puzzle when thinking about campaigning. So just first starting with the political context that we're in right now, um, it's sort of hard to imagine, but it's been just over four years um, since Boris Johnson's Conservative Party won the 2019 election. Um, and the world seems uh, a very different place now to how it did then. Um, we've obviously seen Rich Sunak facing his own difficulties, um, as has um, Labour with national debates over things like um, clean air policies with ULES, um, and also HS2, um, particularly relevant in the INGO space, is obviously um, issues in the Middle East that are becoming very politically divisive as well. Um, so the next UK general election must be held on or before um, the 28th of January 2025, which I think is uh, a year from this Sunday. Um, Labour have been polling considerably higher than the Conservatives for some time, um, and this is reflected in quite a few, quite a big success for Labour in local elections last May. Um, but as we said, politics can change very quickly, so we're sure there'll be um, lots um, of developments before the next election takes place. So as I said, we'll cover not just charity law, but also election law. Um, so the what we're planning to do today is give you a quick run through of the key legal rules and principles around elections and campaigning, which you need to know. The next slide summarizes the regulatory landscape for charities and political activity in England and Wales ahead of an election. Um, and we'll go into all of this obviously in, in more detail. But as you can see, there are three main areas of regulation around charities carrying out political activity ahead of an election. The first is usual charitable charity law restrictions, 
uh, which apply either directly to charities or might apply indirectly to non-charities which receive charitable funding. Um, these are set out in the Charity Commission for England and Wales guidance CC9 um, and cover campaigning and political activity by charities at any time. There's then a separate election law framework, which is applicable to all organisations, not just charities. Um, and this is split between the general rules, which are originally set out in PEPERA, the Political Parties, Elections and Referendums Act 2000. Um, that was amended in 2014 by the Lobbying Act, and so is often known as the Lobbying Act. Um, and that was further amended last year by the Elections Act 2022, um, with the result that it will now apply to more organisations. There are separate rules governing local campaigning, so local constituency campaigning, and those were in the Representation of the People Act 1983. Um, but we'll come back to all of that in more detail, so you don't need to remember that for now. Focusing first on the Charity Commission's guidance, there are a number of relevant pieces of Charity Commission guidance in this area. The main one, as I said, is CC9, Political Activity and Campaigning by Charities. The Commission also, though, has specific guidance in relation to elections and referendums. And last October, it launched a five minute guide covering the principles in this area at a high level. Last January, the Commission also consulted on new draft guidance related to charities and social media, which we'll also talk about. The final guidance was published in the autumn. But to start with, for anyone new to these rules, it's important to understand the terminology the Charity Commission uses. The Commission distinguishes in its guidance between different types of non-political campaigning and political activity, with different principles applying to each. First of all, some charity campaigning is intended to affect individual behaviour, so campaigns to encourage changes to individual behaviours around gambling or to help people make healthy lifestyle choices around diet, alcohol or drug misuse. The Charity Commission refers to all of this in, in its guidance as campaigning as opposed to political activity, which we'll come on to. The Commission says that it uses the word campaigning to refer to awareness raising and efforts to educate or involve the public by mobilising their support on a particular issue or to influence or change public attitudes. It also uses it to refer to campaigning activity which aims to ensure that existing laws are observed. This kind of non-political campaigning would also include campaigning for changes to corporate behaviour, such as this campaign encouraging businesses to take action in relation to modern slavery. Again, <clears throat> this is looking to influence the behaviour of private actors in society and doesn't involve influencing law or public policy. So broadly, a charity can carry out any amount of these type of campaigning activities without limitation, provided obviously that that campaigning furthers the charity's charitable purposes. So, on the other hand, the Charity Commission takes a different approach to what's called political activity or political campaigning. Um, and what's meant by political activity or political campaigning is campaigning or advocacy activity which is intended to secure changes to uh, or secure the retention of law or policy. Um, so, for example, this campaign by Refuge Charity um, sought to make threats to share intimate images of crime um, and that was ultimately successful on the Domestic Abuse Act. Um, similarly, these campaigns by Valley Initiative and Women's Aid um, sought particular policy responses from the government um, in relation to the impact of COVID-19 on people of colour and survivors of domestic abuse. So the key principles running through the Charity Commission guidance in relation to charities and political activity are that a charity cannot be established for a political purpose, which again is a purpose to affect law or public policy, but that they can undertake political activity um, intended to affect law or policy in support of its charitable purposes. Um, that subjects the qualification that um, the quality or quantity of activity doesn't result in it essentially becoming an implicit purpose within its own rights. So for that reason, political activity could not generally be a charity's sole and continuing activity, 
although it could be a charity that's only activity for a period of time. So, for example, for a charity which um, which purposes were supporting victims of domestic abuse, and its activity for one time could be to, to focus all its work on the uh, passing the domestic abuse bill in Parliament, um, but it couldn't do that continuously after the bill had been passed. So obviously that limitation that a charity can't be established for political purposes is unlikely to be of much importance to most existing organisations because you'll have been established for a separate purpose, which might have as part of it a political aim. Um, but we just mentioned as part of the overarching framework. As Max said, though, it is obviously accepted that charities can carry out um, political activity in furtherance of their objects. The main restriction for charities to bear in mind in practice is that they can never be party political, and various bits of Charity Commission guidance emphasise this point. The idea that charity cannot be party political is based on the idea that charities must act exclusively to further their charitable purposes, and that political parties exist to advance wider political purposes. There are some nuances to this, obviously. First, charities can obviously work with political parties or engage with political parties as long as they do so equally. So it's totally normal and common for charities to, for example, uh, engage with the spokesperson from each political party to encourage movement in a particular policy area or to engage hustings at which different political parties speak. However, it is important to remember that the Commission focuses as much on perceptions of party political political activity as the reality. Obviously, it can be difficult for charities to control public perceptions of them, particularly when issues relating to a charity's purposes become the subject of political debate. Looking, for example, at the cost of living crises and anti-poverty charities or international relations and, and conflict around the world. Just because it's interesting, there are also areas in which charities can be party political. So there are some nuances to that rule. The main nuance is for student unions, which generally have educational or charitable objects. And as you may be aware, student unions can uh, have different political party societies. So you might have a university Labour Society, university Conservative Society, or the university Liberal Democrat Society, which I think Liz Truss was president of when she was at university. And that's because the idea is that engaging students in debate and giving them that opportunity is educational in itself and it's permissible for student unions, provided that they have clubs for each major political party. So the core principles um, for charities and political activity are covered in the Charity Commission guidance um, named CC9. Um, and this is the main guidance um, on charities and political activity. And it provides that any political activity should be reasonably expected for the charity's purposes and proportionate in terms of resources use. Um, it's a long piece of guidance and goes into lots more detail. And it should see, be seen as the core starting point for any charity campaigning. But in addition to um, its core guidance in CC9, um, the Charity Commission has also issued a supplementary guidance um, for charities engaging with elections and referendums. It's said to apply for announcements of an election until the election date um, and is read um, in coordination with CC9. But we think that the guidance does really change the core principles in CC9. And it recognises that the risk of a charity being perceived as party political um, is increased in the run-up to a political event. Um, and it tries to apply the rules under CC9 to what the charity can see as some key risk areas. Um, these are entire policies, publicity, parties and candidates. So on policies, um, it states that a charity's party policy position on a particular issue may coincide with or be more or less similar to that of one of the political parties. In this case, it's entirely acceptable for the charity to continue to campaign on that issue and to advocate its policy as long as it makes clear its independence from any political party advocating the same policy 
and there's nothing to encourage support from any political policy. From any political party. Um, on publicity, it states that a charity may promote its views and issues which relate to its purposes and activities. Um, however, a charity must steer clear of explicitly comparing its views um, with those of political parties or candidates taking part in the election. On partisan candidates, um, the guidance states that um, charities must never support a candidate or party or donate to a party or candidate, which obviously seems somewhat quite obvious. Um, it also suggests that trustees must not encourage support for any political party, and that one way of making sure that a charity does not do that may be to invite representatives from as wide a political from as wide a political spectrum as possible to events that the charity is running. Just picking up quickly on one of the questions in the Q&A, when we talk about Charity Commission guidance here, we're talking about guidance issued by the Charity Commission for England and Wales. Um, the charity regulators in Scotland and Northern Ireland have their own bespoke guidance, um, which charities in, in registered in those jurisdictions or active in those jurisdictions to, should, should have regard to, um, but they're broadly similar. Although I think CCNI, the regulator in Northern Ireland, and OSCA, the regulator in Scotland, might sometimes take slightly different approaches to issues of regulation um, on political activity, their guidance is broadly similar. Uh, similarly, when we come to election law, while there are different regimes in those jurisdictions, they're broadly similar. And, and uh, this presentation should give kind of a, a broad sense of what the regimes are in those countries. Um, <clears throat> so we've talked a lot about what charities themselves can do corporately in terms of political activity. And it's worth just quickly touching on what this means for individuals as employees or trustees. These principles about political activity set out in CC9 and the other guidance which Max has talked through apply to charities corporately rather than to individuals, but there can be some grey areas. Senior members of staff or trustees might be seen as closely linked to a charity in the public eye, um, and we'll touch on how that's applied in the Charity Commission's new guidance on social media. And it's always important to make sure that as an individual, you're not using the charity's resources for any personal political activities. That obviously means not using um, physical resources and kind of online resources like your email address and your a phone that might be um, provided by the charity. But it also means not using your staff time, not carrying out personal political activity on paid staff time, for example. So the Charity Commission has published um, guidance um, for charities using social media. Um, it first published draft guidance in January last year um, and then ran a consultation to which it received around 400 responses. Um, and then in September last year, um, the Commission published the final guidance and its response to the consultation. Um, Many of the headline principles in the guidance, which you can see on the slides, are non-controversial. Um, but some of, some of the final guidance, which was uh, amended by the consultation from the draft, uh, was quite helpful in the clarifications that it made. Um, for example, the Commission has recognised the charity might use social media to comment on social and cultural issues outside of its purposes, where to do so would help further the charity's purposes indirectly, um, which is extremely helpful. Um, one of the key requirements in the guidance is for charities to have a social media policy. And it's also outlines what a social media policy should cover. Um, it suggests that the policy will help you to explain um, your guidelines around the conduct of trustees, staff, and volunteers when using social media and part of the charity, um, how you will engage with the public on social media. Um, this might be, for example, your rules on moderating comments on charity social media and those um, outside of the charity. Um, it also covers who is responsible for day-to-day -day management of the charity's social media and who needs to be involved if things go wrong. Um, for example, at a larger charity um, operation, this is more likely done by employees, um, 
with smaller charity um, where you have less resources and staff, um, this data management uh, might see a more active role of trustees there. Um, and then it also covers how your charity might use social media um, to help deliver your charity's purposes. Um, so this, the obvious way that a charity could do this would be um, for engaging a charity's beneficiaries, the wider public on issues that affect the charity. Um, for NGOs, it could be raising awareness of conflicts or humanitarian situations um, with the public worldwide. Um, but you could also do other social media posting to help raise your charity's profile and support its purposes. Um, for example, congratulating, congratulating Luke Lipsler in his recent success at the darts. So while there are clearly huge benefits to social media and the guidance recognises this, its reach, flexibility and fast pace inevitably results in pitfalls and risks and the Charity Commission's guidance really focuses in on those risks. Um, I'm sure you'll all have seen the Twitter storm over the RSPB's tweet, which is shown on this slide a couple of months ago. The Charity Commission are now investigating the RSPB for this tweet. Um, but even pending completion of that investigation, they released statements saying that they thought it was a serious mistake. Now, while, as we've said, charities can never offer their support or opposition to political parties or candidates or individual politicians, they're perfectly entitled to criticise politicians for their policy decisions, where to do so should they can, in the trustees' eyes, reasonably further the charity's mission. In this slide, we think it's difficult to see how the RSPB's commentary here, calling a number of politicians liars due to uh, statements they had made, which differed from previous statements they'd made around environmental protections, um, and was therefore clearly tied to a live and relevant policy decision. We think it's difficult to see how that could breach the prohibition against party political activity. Having said that, in divisive issue areas, and particularly ahead of an election, there's clearly a risk that policy-based commentary, which focuses in on individual politicians, like this tweet, could be misinterpreted as having a party political aim, or as otherwise being harmful to a charity's brand or reputation. It's important, therefore, for charities to consider those risks and set out the approach that it wants to take in some sort of political activity or social media policy. The Charity Commission now expects all charities using social media, as Max said, to have a policy, and also asks in its annual return whether charities have a political activity policy. The other thing to note from this, this um, incident with the RSPB is that one of the RSPB's own trustees went on Twitter to criticise it for using this tweet or for sending this tweet. That again highlights the importance of having an organisationally agreed approach to risk and, and risk tolerance. Um, it's important that if you are doing things like criticising politicians on a personal level for their policy decisions, not only is that tied to a live and relevant policy issue, but also that trustees and senior managers have signed off on that, um, on that approach. So coming again to personal and professional use of social media, um, we think that the Gary Lineker affair demonstrates the difficulties of treating the personal accounts of senior staff um, in a uniform way, um, particularly if that contradicts your own social media policies. Um, the Charity Commission states that trustees, charity employees, and other individuals have the right to exercise their freedom of expression within the law and their communications, including when using social media. However, it goes on to state that there is no expectation that trustees monitor personal social media accounts. However, if they become aware of content posted or shared by an individual being associated with and having a negative effect on the charity, they should consider what action to take to protect the charity. To help manage the risks and any impact on the charity, um, trustees should share guidelines with their trustees, staff and volunteers for example, through their social media policy. The Charity Commission's initial draft guidance seems to suggest that trustees should have some oversight of personal social media accounts. 
However, the final version of the guidance helpfully clarifies that that isn't the case. However, trustees are expected to react and consider how to respond if issues occur, and whether it would be sensible for trustees to consider in advance whether to apply guidance on social media use <laughs> to trustees, staff, and volunteers. Um, generally, we think it's difficult to argue that a junior staff member or volunteer should need to um, use their social media in a very considered way to avoid making controversial political statements um, because of a risk to the charity that they're working for. However, trustees might feel difficult, more differently um, about senior members of staff, um, particularly in certain sectors of where what they could post on their social media could um, definitely potentially reflect badly on the charity itself. And that principle also applies more broadly than just to um, social media. Someone asked in the chat how charities should deal with a trustee who's politically aligned. And obviously, lots of charities do have people who are politically aligned on their boards, even MPs and, and members of the Lords. Um, and that is often a, a welcome thing. Um, <clears throat> different charities will take different approaches to how to uh, navigate the risk that that alignment means that the charity itself might be seen politically aligned. Um, and that's for a board of trustees to consider, and that's what the charity commission would expect. It's also worth just touching very briefly um, to end this section on, on the charity commission, on the charity commission's focus in recent months and years on a better kind of public discourse. Orlando Fraser, the relatively new chair of the commission has kind of repeated this call for charities to respect, campaign with respect and tolerance and show model a better kind of public discourse um, and he's based this on the fiduciary duty on charities to protect their assets which includes a duty to protect their reputation which is an asset um, i think we would probably say that although that's often a welcome call it might not always be appropriate and there are lots of issues particularly as public debate gets more and more divided in lots of senses, um, where it isn't really possible or, or reasonable for a charity to engage with a, a policy issue or policy proposal with respect or tolerance. There are many issues where a charity's objects will mean necessarily that certain policy proposals are totally uh, opposed to the charity's objects. Um, and campaigning with a level of strength or strength of feeling um, will be what's expected by charity stakeholders and would be helpful in terms of maintaining the charity's reputation among its stakeholders. Um, so it's just worth, I mean, but, but even having said that, it's worth bearing in mind the Charity Commission's uh, stated position. We had one more case study here, but Max, I actually wonder if we might just skip through to the election law section thinking about time. Yeah, yeah. sure. So obviously we've covered charity law here, but we also want to cover um, election law. Um, so there's a separate framework of rules around spending on campaign materials at elections, um, which applies to all non-party campaigners, um, regardless of structure, so charities or not. So the body of law that many people refer to as the Lobbying Act is actually contained in PEPERA, um, the political party's elections and referendums at 2000, which was introduced to various political funding scandals um, to give greater transparency on donations and the spending of political parties, um, but also third party campaigners that might be seen to support the parties. It creates the framework of registration with the electoral commission, spending and donation controls, and reporting requirements. Um, the Lobbying Act in 2014 significantly expanded the campaigning rules for non-party campaigns in the PERA, um, and this was further extended um, by the Elections Act 2022. There's also a separate regime for low campaigns, which we'll briefly cover later. So what does the regime mean for non-party campaigners? Essentially, um, if a charity expects to incur what's called regulated spending um, of over 
£10,000 um, within the electoral period, um, then it will need to register within with the Electoral Commission. If I expect to spend over £20,000 in England or £10,000 in any of the devolved nations, then it must register with the Electoral Commission as a full non-party campaigner. Um, and if it expects to spend over £10,000 or below these limits, then it must register as a lower tier campaigner. Um, essentially, the lower tier campaigner has slightly less stringent reporting requirements than for full non-party campaigners. Um, there's a maximum limit of cost UK spending of around £700,000 um, if you do register. Um, but it's just important to highlight also that if a campaigner takes the view there is no prospect of incurring regulated spending above this £10,000 threshold, then there is no need to, re to register and therefore no reporting requirements. So what kind of spending by campaigners might be regulated under these rules? Essentially, spending on most public-facing activity will be caught if it can reasonably be seen as intended to influence an election outcome. In the legislation, that's described as something which could be seen as intended to promote or procure the electoral su success at a relevant election of one or more particular registered parties, one or more parties who advocate for particular policies, or one or more candidates who hold or do not hold particular opinions or otherwise fall within a particular category of candidates. Obviously, registered charities would not be campaigning in a way which could be seen as intended to influence people to vote for one or more parties, because that would be a breach of charity law. But they could well be campaigning uh, for <clears throat> in a way which might be seen as intended to encourage people to vote for a particular group of candidates. Um, that could be outside of the development sector, campaigning for female candidates to achieve better gender balance in Parliament, or campaigning for candidates who are supportive of an increased commitment to overseas aid, or who are opposed to the Rwanda scheme, for example. So that's the way in which issue-based campaigners who aren't campaigning for or against parties could be caught. And a reminder, if the regime does apply, if you are carrying out that kind of public-facing campaign activity, that doesn't mean that you can't do it as a charity. It simply means that if you're going to spend more than £10,000 on that kind of regulated activity in the year before the general election, you need to register. That's a lower threshold than previously, and that's one of the key changes in the Elections Act 2022. It used to be £20,000 across the UK. It's also important to bear in mind that that figure includes staff time, and so particularly for large organisations, can be reached relatively quickly. So in the existing guidance in the code of practice, um, the electoral commission suggests using these frames to assess if something passed the purpose test. For example, is there an explicit or implicit call to action to vote in a particular way? Is the tone of the content positive or negative to particular candidates? How close is the election? And are there other contextual factors which are relevant? And does the campaign focus on a key divisive issue between the main parties? One of the other aspects of the rules which you might have heard of are the joint working rules. These are often seen as the most pernicious aspect of the regime. The joint working rules essentially mean that one campaigner, where, where a number of campaigners campaign under a common plan or arrangement, each campaigner needs to uh, account for the spending of the other campaigners. So that means you could have two campaigners uh, who agree a joint campaign, they each spend, say, £6,000, um, <clears> they would each need to account for the others, and they would each therefore spend £12,000 and need to register as non-party campaigners under the regime. That can be really difficult, given that coalition working is so common and so important, but the administrative burden of registering won't be appealing to many campaigners. The Electoral Commission has recently released a new code of practice, and the code of practice includes some useful guidance on what is and isn't joint campaigning. 
In particular, it's important to note that signing a letter alongside other non-party campaigners without any financial commitment won't be seen as joint campaigning under the rules, nor will speaking at an event organised by another campaigner, nor holding discussions about areas of common interest without coordinating campaign activity. On the other hand, what would be joint campaigning is, for example, having a coalition meeting where you say uh, one campaigner has great success or inroads with young people and will focus on approaching young people to vote in a particular way where another whereas another campaigner has a different group of supporters um, and will campaign with them that would be seen as joint campaign so we mentioned that the spending thresholds under the era and you know, the lobbying act regime look at the regulated period which is always the period of 12 months before a general election is called, regardless of how far in advance the election itself is called. Um, this has been a cause of concern for quite a few issue-based campaigners. Um, it essentially can cause uncertainty about whether they might be found to be campaigning during a regulated period, even if they did not realize that was the case at the time. Um, for example, in 2017, uh, Theresa May was adamant that there would be no snap election on March 20th, um, and then under a month later um, called a general election for June. Um, then in 2019, um, there was a lot of uncertainty and speculation about whether and when we would be headed for a uh, general election before it was eventually called for December of that year. So currently the last possible date for an election is January 2025, uh, meaning that the next regulated period begins um, in January 2024, so this Sunday at the latest. Um, we think it's more likely that the Conservatives um, will hold on that long, and we think it's most likely the election will come in autumn this year, potentially in October or November. What's important to note is that campaigners can take comfort from the practical reality that although regulated periods can be retrospective, most campaigns before an election is announced will likely not meet the purpose test because a campaigner gen generally shouldn't reasonably be regarded as incurring spending to influence an election that hasn't yet been called. And there's actually express electoral commission guidance to support the general position. The new code of practice states that an ongoing campaign on a particular issue is unlikely to be reasonably regarded as intending to influence voters to vote in a particular way. So we've talked about whether you have to register. I'll just quickly touch on what that actually means if you register. Um, so the main requirement is that, that there's an obligation to keep invoices or receipts for payments over £200 made as part of your spending on regulated activity um, and to report to the Electoral Commission in detail on all of that spending, which includes submitting copies of invoices. Um, it's also important to ensure that you have an authorised person who is responsible for authorising any expenditure on regulated activity. And there are controls on donations, which means that donations for regulated activity can only be received from permissible donors. Permissible donors broadly mean people on the UK electoral register or companies or other groups with a sufficient connection to the UK. It's not possible for organisations to receive funding from overseas organisations for political activity. I also just want to touch very quickly on the imprint rules, which are another aspect of election law, which apply whether or not you register as a non-party campaigner broadly, at least in relation to printed materials. Um, so on printed materials, it's been an obligation for a number of years to include an imprint. And an imprint is uh, shown on the bottom bullet point there, and you might recognise it from political leaflets, which you receive through the door. It needs to say who something is printed by, uh, and on whose behalf it's printed by and on whose behalf um, they're acting. So this would often say, for example, if it was from a political candidate in your constituency, printed by a printing company, promote, promoted by your local candidate's agent on behalf of the agent with an address. Those rules have just been extended to digital material 
um, where that digital material could reasonably be seen as intending to influence to vote in a particular way. It applies to all paid for digital, digital materials, so things like Facebook and Twitter ads, but also if you register as a non-party campaigner or have another status with the Electoral Commission, applies to organic material. Um, so that's why you may have seen lots of politicians and other campaigners update their Twitter bios to include a sentence like this explaining who the, who's promoting material on whose behalf they're promoting it with an address, because that's one of the other significant changes introduced by the Elections Act 2022. So we just very briefly want to touch on local campaigning rules as well. Oops. Um, so essentially these rules come from the representation of the People Act 1983 and they impose a limit of £700 on spending with a view to promoting, procuring or prejudicing the election of a candidate in a specific local area after the dissolution of Parliament. Um, although this will not generally be engaged by general issue-based campaigns, it's necessary for them to think about how these rules could apply and how they might interact with the general campaigning rules we have already discussed. <clears throat> So we then just very quickly also wanted to cover what you can say in campaigns. Um, this isn't a facet of election law necessarily, although there are, there are some nuances thanks to election law. Um, so the first thing for charities, which isn't on the slide, but is always important to bear in mind, is to ensure that what you're doing is in line with your charitable objects in some way. Um, and on particularly controversial areas, there's obviously a risk of criticism that what you're saying isn't justified or isn't in line with your charitable objects. It's then important at any time to think about the risk of defamation, particularly if you're criticising individual politicians or corporates or even other countries. Um, when it comes to election law, there's a specific prohibition against making false statements about someone's, a candidate's personal conduct or character. Um, so while it is permissible to engage in policy debate and claim that a candidate thinks something, it's unlawful to make a false statement of fact about a candidate's personal conduct or character. And then finally, just very briefly, <clears throat> as with any campaign material, it's important to think about usage rights. Are you using a company's brand, a person's face, and do you have appropriate rights to use that kind of thing? <clears throat> we then wanted to run through a couple of case studies before coming into questions, I think. <clears throat> Yeah, I might just skip these more general ones and come to the more relevant ones for NGOs here, actually, just in the interest of time. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, so we've touched briefly on uh, the, the conflict currently in Israel and Gaza. This um, <clears throat> case study is from, I think, a number of charities who uh, projected this onto the House of Parliament, calling for a ceasefire. And... This, in terms of charity law, would clearly be permissible for a charity which has objects related to the conflict, so any objects to relieve humanitarian need, for example, calling for a ceasefire clearly falls squarely within that. Um, but we did see other charities criticised for calling for a ceasefire when it was felt that that went outside of their charitable remit. would expect most INGOs working in this space to have objects which would be relevant to calling for a ceasefire, but it's important in any campaigning activity or any activity as a charity to be aware of what your objects are. If, for example, you are a charity working in um, Sri Lanka, for example, and your objects are limited to work in Sri Lanka, then you could be criticised for calling for a ceasefire or an end to us hostilities in another part of the world. In terms of election law, um, <clears throat> This doesn't call, include any implicit or explicit call to action to voters in a particular way. Um, we think it's a clear call to politicians to change their policy approach and to raise awareness of, of the issue. Um, it is possible, feasible, that even where there's no explicit call to action to voters to vote in a particular way, that a, a campaign like this 
could be seen as encouraging voters to vote in a particular way. For example, where the issue is so clearly divisive along party lines that calling for something which a, a major party is calling for in an election period could be seen as encouraging people to vote in that way, um, which I think is maybe a good segue to the next case study. Yeah, so the Stop Rwanda hashtag campaign was um, a campaign, I think, which was led by Care for Calais and signed on to by some other organisations. Um, again, approach it from the same framework, first looking at charity law um, for charities which have a humanitarian or human rights focus or work with refugees, um, becoming involved in such a campaign to protect refugees from being deported to um, Rwanda would be arguably within their purposes um, and therefore permissible from a charity law perspective. Again, considerations are soon raised around um, uh, scope and whether charity works. For example, a charity in Sri Lanka would have um, less reason to argue that such a campaign would be within its purposes. Um, then coming to the election law side, initially this campaign was launched um, a while ago outside of the regulated period. Um, and it was used to stop the flights um, from taking place to actually for the deportation to practice. Um, but now, as we come into the regulated period, we would generally use Rwanda as the issue which would be likely to pass the purpose test, regardless of whether you talk about voting. Um, so because the, the major political parties are so divided in Rwanda, um, if you look talking about stop Rwanda now within the context of a general election happening this year, it could be seen and arguably would be seen by a reasonable person as a call to action for people um, to vote against the Conservatives who are the chief opponents of this policy. And therefore, it is likely that it would be classed as regulated spend under the Lobbying Act regime. And then just very quickly, we want to touch on speaking out in solidarity either with groups of people or other organisations. Um, this, again, would be unlikely to engage the election law regime unless there was particular language which made it look like a call to action to vote in a particular way, um, or unless the parties have particularly divided positions. Um, but it's important always for a charity, at least, to think about whether um, speaking out either in solidarity with a particular group of people um, or an organisation which is subject to criticism or attack within the sector aligns with your charitable objects. Uh, very, very briefly, we want to touch on first the foreign influence registration scheme. Uh, we think you're potentially hosting another webinar um, later this year on the scheme, but just wanted to uh, briefly draw attention to it. Um, essentially, it's a scheme which comes from the National Security Act and will come into force later this year. Um, it's a two-tier scheme. Um, the most uh, important of these tiers is what's called the political activity, the fiscal influence um, tier. Um, and that requires when an organization um, or individual makes an arrangement with power um, which requires a direction from a foreign power. Um, so a foreign power is interpreted as a state entity. So it could be um, an, a foreign government or foreign local government. And there's a direction to carry out political influence activities. Um, so that could be um, engaging with MPs, either publicly or privately, um, also running uh, public campaigning activities. Um, and there are no exemptions, and there's a need to uh, register um, under the scheme. Um, and so the activities are, are available to the public. Um, and then just so another few very brief um, areas to outline. Um, so there are rules requiring member approval for political spending and donations. Um, advertising law can be relevant to campaign content. Um, there's also a separate regime regulating communications with ministers and senior civil servants. Um, 
and where payments by third party, which can sometimes be relevant to restricted funding arrangements. So we have around 10 minutes left. Um, should we come on to questions? Great. So I was just looking at a couple of the questions in the chat. Um, maybe if we start with the charity law questions and then move on to some of the election law questions. Um, <clears throat> so someone had asked earlier on, and sorry for missing this, um, uh, can you clarify the situation regarding inviting representatives of political parties to events and that this must be balanced? Um, when does this kick in during the general election official campaign or all the time? Um, so the Charity Commission's CC9 guidance applies all the time. And I think the Charity Commission's position would be that if you regularly invited politicians from one party um, or invited politicians only from one party to a particular event, that could be seen as giving an advantage to that party and trying to endorse that party. Um, whereas if you, you know, you don't necessarily need to invite all of the parties to every event you do, but if you have an annual headline event and you have a speaker from Labour one year, you should think about trying to get a speaker from another major party the next year. Um, <clears throat> having said that, that does then, the Commission's position, and I think this is understandable, it's that the risk of appearing to be party political increases in the run-up to election, an election. Um, and certainly once an election is called. So I think that that risk then increases and it's more important to try to be fair, even-handed and fair as the election comes closer. Um, just on Evangeline's question, um, if one of our policy positions asked becomes picked up by a political party, how should we respond? Um, you could respond to this and welcome it, for example, in your social media. Um, however, you should also be clear that you're not, um, that's not equating to support more generally for that party. Um, and you should, for example, um, in, the, in the statement, you could say, we're happy that X parties pay this stuff, we encourage other parties to also adopt this policy. Um, so just being very clear that, you know, you're, uh, party neutral, but you can welcome individual parties um, picking up your policy as, as long as you take the same approach across the political spectrum. Yeah, totally. Then moving to some of the questions around the election law framework. Um, so first of all, someone had asked a non-profit companies which are not parties bound by any of these rules. Um, and yes, obviously the charity law rules don't apply unless you have accepted grant funding from a charity and agreed to comply with charity law, which might be relatively common for non-profits which have charity funding. Um, but the election law rules do apply. Um, and it's maybe just as important um, to consider these rules um, for non-charities because you don't have those charity law restrictions, which means that there is simply no way in which you should be doing things which might be seen as encouraging people to vote in a particular way for parties. Um, and so a non-charity which was carrying out activity which might reasonably be seen as encouraging people to vote in a particular way would have to register. Um, and probably the, the majority of organisations do register, although there's generally a couple of charities who do it, um, the majority would be non-charities. Um, just quickly on, on Peter, your question on pro bono work and probably spending limits. Um, essentially, a pro bono work would be, my understanding would be volunteer work, um, and that wouldn't be counted, um, as in the, the organisation would, would spend no cost um, in in, in using that resource, so there will be no nothing to count towards the rate of spend in that way. The slight nuance to that is that while volunteer work and kind of a charity carrying out pro bono work directly has no spend, exactly as Max said, if you're, if you're a charity which is receiving pro bono support from another organisation which would generally charge for its time, that would be seen as notional spending. Um, and would count as having a value in terms of your election law spend. So if you ran a, 
large campaign, which included regulated activity, say, said, vote for candidates who support a greater overseas aid commitment, um, probably something snappier than that, but along those lines, and you received pro bono support from an advertising company, you would need to value that in line with um, how the advertising company would usually charge. Whereas that's that's contrasted with if you um, if the campaign is run by a volunteer who's volunteering with you for three days a week, or you ask lots of volunteers to amplify posts on Twitter, none of that is deemed as having a spend because it's volunteer time. There was also a question um, from Elliot around how does this relate to encouraging people or preparing people to vote in general, um, which is a great question. Generally, get out the vote drives or voter information campaigns shouldn't be seen as regulated uh, under this under the election law regime because they generally will be neutral and shouldn't be seen as encouraging people to vote in a particular way. There are though some limits to that. Obviously, if the Conservative Party or Momentum ran a voter registration campaign, that clearly would be seen as encouraging people to vote in a particular way. Um, and so it depends not only on, on kind of which organisation is running it, but kind of what the language and, and themes around the campaign might be. Um, but generally, that shouldn't be regulated. Um, if you're a charity, obviously, it's important to think about how that furthers your charitable purposes as well, um, and whether you can justify doing it in line with the charitable purposes. Often, I think that should should be possible, um, but it's worth thinking about. I think we probably have time for maybe one more question, Max, if there were any um, which caught your eye. Um, just on Sophie's question, which is interesting one around the case studies and support to launch an initial like, campaign um and if it's an issue that two major parties don't support could that be seen as a call to action to vote for smaller parties um this is a good question and for example you know the green party might have more pro international development or climate change policies that um labor and conservatives don't um essentially call to action it would it would depend very much on the fiscal climate at, at the time and what exactly the parties come out with. But you could definitely frame it in a way uh, where it's not being seen as a call to action. Um, and I think that, you know, it shouldn't be seen as just because parties can pick up or certain political parties can pick up policies. This shouldn't be a preclusion to you running issue based campaigns on those. Um, there are so many political parties, at particular local level across the UK, and you know you shouldn't be expected um, to have to run ones that run campaigns that avoid aligning too much with the aims of one party. Um, where it becomes very politically divisive, um, and a politically divisive mainstream issue, we always think you know we mentioned Rwanda uh, as being very um, you know very much one that could, would be seen as a call to action there. I don't think that particular example of race would necessarily be a problem. Great, thank you. I think we are at about time. Um, so thank you everyone for joining and for your really interesting questions. There were a couple of questions um, in the chat which we didn't get to. So if there's a way of us collating those, we'll try and come back to you if we can afterwards. But if not, please do get in touch. Um, our details will be circulated with the slides, I think. Um, and Bond also has a great page of resources which links to uh, Bond's own briefing paper on these issues, the Electoral Commission's guidance, the Charity Commission guidance, and a free guide that we prepared with the Sheila McKechnie Foundation around um, charity campaigning. So hopefully all of those are useful. Um, but yeah, our details will be circulated as well. So please feel free to get in touch if that's helpful. Thank you so much for your time, Sue and Max. I think that was... Uh fantastically helpful and yeah you're right we will make sure that we send everything around i've put a link to the page the bond page which has a lot of this information on in the chat but yeah we'll send everything around but thank you so much for your time and and um, for your help uh it was incredibly useful and yeah we'll be in touch with with uh, some further questions if need be thanks everyone thanks Bye. so much okay have a wonderful week folks thank you so much